In this video, we're going to be talking about idempotency and APIs. If you don't know what idempotency is and you don't know why it's important with regards to APIs, then this video is going to answer all your questions. So let's just get right into it. And at first, I want to talk about a kind of a prerequisite concept, and that's called API resiliency. API resiliency just refers to the concept that we build APIs that are able to recover from failure. So there's a bunch of different ways in which this applies and how you can recover from failures in APIs from a server. So say we have a client and a resource server that's providing some kind of functionality. And say we're working with the context of bank accounts. So we have an API that's called create bank account. So say we call this API from the client perspective, there's many things that could happen. We can get success, we can get failure, we can get a dependency issue due to the resource server, or we can get the dreaded no response. We never got anything back from the server. So what's the natural way that any common application would probably deal with this? Well, you just retry, right? As the saying goes, if at first you don't succeed, you try, try again. And it turns out that retries is a very, very effective way to handle failure. And the thing is, you don't just retry right away. You don't fail or don't get a response and just immediately hammer the server once more with another request. You want to use something called exponential back off where you wait a period of time. If you fail again, you wait an even longer period of time. And it turns out this is a really, really great way to give the resource server the ability to recover especially if it's under duress, maybe it's getting a lot of concurrent requests at the same time. Exponential back off is a great way to take some stress off the server. But there's a problem now, right? We want to retry this operation. But how do we know when we retry this operation again to the resource server, how do we know that this original request to create that bank account didn't actually succeed on the back end? Maybe it, it stored the bank account in its database and called its dependencies, but maybe there was a network connection issue and it never returned a response despite having internally succeeded. Now, if we retry this operation again, we call, you know, create bank account after we got the no response, then we're going to potentially have two different bank accounts now. That's not what we wanted. We only wanted one bank account. So this is a big problem. So we want to build resilient APIs by supporting this notion of automatic retries, but it turns out that a prerequisite for retries is an idempotent API operation. So what the heck is an idempotent API operation? Well, an idempotent API operation is when a request can be retransmitted or retried with no additional side effects. When a request can be retransmitted or retried with no additional side effects. In the context of our example, you call multiple times, but you still only get one bank account at the end of the day. That is the type of behavior that an idempotent API operation supports. So we kind of have this chain of dependency now. Now, in order to create resilient APIs, we need to depend on client retries. And in order for client retries to be supported, we depend on idempotent API operations. Well, the next question is, what does idempotent API operations depend on? Well, the answer is nothing. We can cleverly create our own API operations, and I want to talk about how to do that now. So let's take a rather naive approach at creating an idempotent API uh, with attempt number one. So in order to create an idempotent operation, what do we have to do? How do we how do we guarantee that we don't create a bank account twice in that previous example? Well, the key is we need to identify something at the resource server that is unique, that allows us to group these requests together somehow so that we can detect that, you know, we don't want to create two bank accounts, even though we got two separate requests, we only want to create one. So what's a naive way of doing that? Well, we can call that create bank account API again, and we call it with input arguments, right? So what do those API input arguments look like? Well, they probably look a little bit something like this. So maybe you have a client name, you have a client ID, you have an account type, and you have some other details, like whether or not it's a joint account. Well, these API arguments aren't going to change from request to request, even if we're throwing retries at this resource server to handle some kind of failure. So it turns out we can leverage these input arguments because they are unique and consistent across multiple different retries. So what we can do is on the resource server side, we can take those API input arguments, throw them through some kind of hash function, and then spit out a request token. And this can be just a UUID or any other kind of hash output that you desire. And on the resource server side, we can store that token in some kind of internal database, maybe a cache that's stored on the server or maybe another kind of data store. So in other words, the first time we get this request, 
the server takes a look at the input arguments, throws it through a hash function, produces some kind of token. The resource server then stores that token in an internal database and then finally services the request. If we get another request here due to a failure in this initial flow, either no response or some other kind of error, we check the state store to see if we already have a copy of that token in a short period of time. And if we do, then maybe we just give the same response back or do something different. But we definitely don't create two different accounts because this request is correlated with the other request that previously came in. So using this method, we can easily just return a success back. And this method could also handle you know, multiple requests that come in in a short period of time as a result of retries. But let's pause there for a second. Let's think about this for a moment. Does this approach always work? Does it always work? Well, it definitely allows us to identify some unique properties as part of the request that can help us group them together. But what if we actually did want to create two different bank accounts? What if we had two different requests that were close together? Say, for example, you know, we have a teller that's communicating with a client and they're at a, a bank branch and the client says to the teller, I want to create a checking account. And the teller clicks the button to create the account. And then they say, oh, no, I actually want to create two bank accounts. Can you create another one? They click the button again. What would happen in this case? Well, you'd get two requests that have the exact same properties but now you'd only end up creating one bank account because you're deduping based on the input arguments. And since these came in at a very similar point in time, you'd only end up creating one bank account, which is not desirable either. So it turns out that this approach kind of works, but not really. And I've personally seen a lot of people use this approach and be bitten by it in the past. This is usually what people do as a first attempt for item potency in their APIs. So what is a better way? What is a better way? And it turns out there is a better way and it's quite, quite simple. We just kind of flip some things around a little bit. So the better way is that instead of the resource server inspecting the input arguments and trying to deduce whether or not this is a repeat request that came in either brand new or as part of a retry, instead we put the onus on the client. We say as part of our API contract that in order to call that create bank account, you need to provide a unique, let's say UUID as an input argument in your create bank account call. And anytime you have any other retries that are part of that same initial batch of calls, you use that same token. So now we're passing in input arguments plus the token. The exact same flow works. Now the resource server will take a look at that token. If it's not there, they'll put it in the state store. They'll service the request and they'll be a success. Another request comes in, maybe due to a partial failure or a retry scenario, it'll have the same token. You'll check the state store. It's already satisfied. You return the exact same response back. And now if we go back to that example where we have that teller that's sitting there with that client, you click it the first time, a token gets generated, the call is made, it succeeds. You click that button again to create a second account. It's a brand new API request that is not part of any previous retry. So now the resource server says, hey, I don't have a copy of this token. I'm going to create another account. So that's how you can get this functionality of item potency without having to take a look at the input arguments by putting the onus into the hands of the client. Well, it turns out it's not all that simple. And there's one additional detail that we need to talk about here. And the detail is, is that if we run into that scenario where we have a call that gets made with a token token that's been previously used before, and remember it can be previously used for a whole variety of different reasons because maybe there was a failure initially and now this is a retry, what we need to do is that we need to return syntactically identical responses for any request that uses the same token. So I'll say that again, we need to return syntactically identical responses for any request that uses the same token. Now why is that important? So let's think about this for a second. So we have this first example where we create the bank account, we generate a token, we pass that in, there's no response back to the client. But on the back end, the resource server, they were able to you know, put something in the state store, they were able to create that account. Everything is working swimmingly from its perspective. That account is already created. Now the client is gonna automatically retry after a period of time because it never got any response, right? So now the second batch of requests comes in. So it calls create bank account again. It passes that same token. Now, what is the resource server supposed to do here? And it has two options, right? It's seen this token before. I've seen it. It came in this request that was up here and I have a record of it in my state store. So there's two reasonable options here. 
The first one is that it can return something like, you know, resource already created or, or something like that, some kind of error back to the caller. And if you think about that, I mean, that's okay. So you have like an error code going back here to the client, but was it really an error? Like the account got created as part of this request, but it's only now being returned in the, res the, the follow-up response because we never got it as part of that first call. So it turns out that if you use a different response code, this can drastically affect the behavior of the clients because now the client may see that resources already created. They may show some kind of error screen, some kind of, you know, resubmit step uh, from that perspective to call this API again and try to create a new bank account. So it turns out that's not desirable. The only desirable outcome here is returning that exact same response as if it was a success in this call when it was really a success in this call. I hope that part made sense. So just to recap, first call gets made with the token, no response, but the account gets created. Client retries because no response was received with the same token, we've already satisfied it, we already have the account that was created, we just returned success true as if it was this request that was successfully creating the account and this will drive the correct behavior from the client perspective, not showing any errors, not showing anything silly because the account got created successfully. So that's the way to create solid idempotent APIs. Now there is a lot of overhead that goes into this, right? You need to have some kind of state store. You need to have client generated tokens that get passed in as part of input. You probably want to bake that into your SDK or something or as part of your API contract. Uh, so this isn't for the faint of heart, but this is the way to guarantee idempotency. So in summary, what did we talk about? So for resilient APIs, we need to use built-in client retries with exponential backoff, and we need to use client-generated tokens to guarantee idempotency. And thirdly, we need to return syntactically identical responses to support predictable client behavior. If you enjoyed this video, there's an excellent article that I'll put in the description section that walks through this in much more detail. Thanks so much for watching.